Good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you're tuning in with us today. Um, we're really excited to have you at our next Ostomy Canada national webinar. Today's topic is going to be on uh, ostomy reversal and we'll discuss when an ostomy reversal may be considered and how this is performed and our discussion will also review important factors and exercises you can do before and after your stoma reversal to optimize your bowel function and recovery. My name is Troy and I'm one of our uh, directors on our board of director for Ostomy Canada Society and I'm so excited to be joined today by our guest speaker Deborah Johnson. But before I get to introducing Deborah, uh, I want to first thank Hollister for making this possible today. It, it's so phenomenal that we have some great partners out there that are able to help deliver this great education and support, and we hope that you enjoyed today's presentation. A couple quick housekeeping items. Firstly, um, if you have any questions, we know that we had quite a few that came in before the webinar. There still is an opportunity to ask some today. If you want to use your Q&A tool in your uh, Microsoft Teams toolbar, you should see it near the chat or the uh, the participants function at the top or bottom of your screen there. It's called Q&A. That'll give a chance for myself and Deborah and our, and our team in the back end here to be able to see those. Another reminder that this will be recorded today and will be available on our website in addition to all of our other recorded webinars that we previously had. If you have any questions after today and you might want to refer to some of our other webinars, we do have some on gas and bloating, diet and nutrition, peristomal hernia and more. So definitely check out our website for that. Now, before we get into the presentation, I first am very excited to introduce our newest executive director, Dana, who is on the line with us today. And I'm going to invite Dana to come on with us to say a few words on behalf of Austin Canada Society. Thanks so much, Dana. Thank you, Troy, and hello to everyone. Welcome. Um, this is our second webinar in our 2023 webinar series, so I'm very excited to be joining you today. And as many of you had read in the introductory video, Ostomy Canada Society is a nonprofit national organization dedicated to all people living with an ostomy and their circles of support, helping you to achieve um, life to the fullest through advocacy, awareness, collaboration, and support. And to meet our mission, Ostomy Canada has aligned our operational work conducted by a diverse and broad set of experienced, enthusiastic and knowledgeable volunteers from across Canada and created five pillar committees. These webinars are offered within our engagement and support pillar as a great opportunity to connect with our ostomy community and to offer education and support to you. Ostomy Canada's vision is to be Canada's voice and agent of change for people living with an ostomy. And to that end, your feedback is always welcomed. Uh, in terms of the webinar series, please do continue to share your ideas and feedback on topic areas that would help you to achieve your life to the fullest. And um, so please, I know that you have in the past given some thoughts and ideas and we welcome those. Uh, so thank you and I hope you enjoy the webinar today. Awesome. Thank you, Dana. And, and to that end as well, we will have a post webinar survey that's going to uh, come up at the end of this webinar too. So I encourage you to take just a couple seconds to fill that out and it'll help influence what we do in the future in terms of our education and support. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, her name is Deborah Johnson and she's a clinical nurse specialist, uh, specialist certified in wound ostomy and constants working at University Health Network Toronto General Hospital. The focus of her practice is to improve the quality of life in patients and their families by developing and promoting quality care through best practice guideline development and education for patients living with chronic wounds, ostomies, and fistulae. As part of her advanced practice role, Deborah is an active member of the interprofessional team providing complex consultations and supporting staff and program development using evidence-based practice and to improve patient, uh, patient care. Deborah has participated in the development of several best practice guidelines pertaining to pressure injuries and ostomy care. She is a clinical faculty member of the Wound Ostomy and Contents Institute Education Program, faculty and clinical advisor for advanced ostomy care and management at the University of Toronto, and an adjunct lecturer at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over the mic to, our, uh, to Deborah, and I look forward to seeing the presentation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Oh. 
Sorry. Good Thank afternoon, you very much. everyone, and welcome to our presentation today on Austin awesome Reversal, Reconnection and Recovery. I just want to extend a special thank you to Austin awesome Canada and also to Hollister for the invitation uh, to present to you today on this very important uh, topic. So I hope for those of you that are uh, considering Austin awesome Reversal, hopefully you've had some of these conversations and you've had some of this teaching uh, with your surgeon and your stoma nurse or your NSWOC at your hospital. For those of you who are maybe still considering an ostomy reversal, uh, hopefully uh, our presentation today will give you some information to kind of think about and uh, maybe questions to ask your surgeon uh, when that conversation arises. So uh, thank you very much again. So um, my name is Deborah Johnston and I'm one of the clinical nurse specialists for wounds and ostomies at Toronto General Hospital. You may also be familiar with the nursing specialty name NSWOC, that just means nurses specialized in wound ostomy incontinence. A long time ago, we used to be called ET nurses or interstomal therapy nurses, but now our nursing specialty uh, goes by the name NSWOC. So I work at Toronto General Hospital and this is an adult hospital and most of our ostomies are created due to surgical oncology diagnosis. So when I think about my own, uh, you know, experience and expertise, please know this is coming from, you know, more of an adult patient population and more from a surgical oncology um, uh, kind of setting. But I started my nursing career in 1994 and I've been working at Toronto General as an NSWOC since 2007. Uh, as a disclosure, I am a member of the Ostomy, uh, Holster Ostomy Advisory Board and I have received remuneration for developing this presentation for you today. So uh, every presentation always has a medical disclaimer at the beginning of it. Just to let you know, this is more of an information resource only. It's not meant to replace any diagnostic or any um, uh, treatment purposes or converse interventions you're having with your surgeon. Unfortunately, I'm not able to provide any advice on specific personal health conditions. But if you do have questions or concerns, please reach out to your healthcare provider for guidance on making any decisions. So without further ado, we'll start our presentation for this afternoon. The objectives today are to discuss what, when, and how of reversing an ostomy. We're gonna look at the preoperative tests and imaging that you might have done and uh, what your hospital stay will look at will look like afterwards. And we're also going to talk about the pre and post operative tips uh, that I can hopefully share with you for a successful recovery afterwards. So just a quick overview of an ostomy. Um, some of you may have had your stoma for a long time. And you know that when you look down and you see that, you know, red rosebud on the surface of your skin, you know that's the end of your small or your large bowel that's brought out to the surface of your skin. But for those of you that maybe had an emergent surgery created, or maybe you had it created at a hospital where there wasn't a stoma nurse available and you're not quite clear on, you know, what that ostomy is and what you're looking at. Uh, when an ostomy is created, what the surgeon is doing is bringing uh, part of the bowel through the abdominal wall and that's going to divert waste either from your digestive tract or from your urinary system into an outside pouch on the surface of your tummy. So for some people, uh, an ostomy is permanent and they're going to have it uh, always. For some people, depending on, you know, how their surgery was, how their stomach was created and just, you know, the disease behind why it was created, some of those are temporary and some can be reversed. So today when we're talking about types of reversible stomas, that could either be a colostomy or could be an ileostomy. So these are two types of fecal diversion, which means that you have stool coming through into your pouch. The third type of stoma is called an ileoconduit or urostomy. And maybe some of you in the audience today have a urine pouch or a urine stoma, and those are temporary, or those are permanent, pardon me. So you're gonna have those ones forever. But for those of you in the, in the crowd that have either colostomy or an ileostomy, sometimes those could be uh, could be reversed. So with the colostomy, that's uh, part of your large bowel or your colon, and that diverts uh, more soft, uh, pay, uh, you know, form stool through, the, through your stoma into an outside pouch. And an ileostomy is made with the ileum or the small bowel, and that diverts more kind of um, pastier stool 
through the stoma into an outside pouch as well. But those are the two stomas that could possibly be reversed. So when we talk about what a, you know what a um, an ostomy reversal is is another surgical procedure. So I think for for some people that I meet in a pre-mission clinic and we know they have a temporary they're going to have a temporary stoma created, we always sort of touch on what the reversal is going to look like. So it is another surgical procedure. So after you know you're well healed and you're back into good health, it's another surgical admission. Uh, you'd come in, it's general anesthetic, and it's a hospital stay afterwards. And by doing that during the reversal, what they're doing is reestablishing uh, your bowel continuity. So they're reconnecting uh, the bowel, uh, uh, the bowel integrity or your bowel function by reconnecting the intestine together. And it allows your stool to pass through the entirety of the large bowel and then through the rectum and then allows it to be passed uh, voluntarily out through the, the anus um, that way and eliminates the need for an external pouch. So um, that's, uh, you know, what a, an awesome reversal is. I think, you know, for the most part, um, you know, when you first have your soma created, it's a longer procedure. Often there's probably some disease that they were taking care of, or maybe it was trauma that was related that they were, um, you know, working on. And then part of that surgery also was your, your stoma creation. Whereas the reversal itself is just taking care of that ostomy, just reversing that, reconnecting the bowel. So for the most part, it's a lot more simpler of an operation than what you had during your original surgery. It still is a hospital stay and it still carries risks and we'll talk about that, but generally it's a lot simpler than what you had done uh, the first time. So a lot of people that have, uh, you know, a temporary stoma, they wonder, you know, when can that be reversed? And I think that's a really good conversation to have, you know, with your, uh, with your surgeon, with your medical team. They want to make sure that you're in optimal health, that you're in the best position that you can be to undergo that second surgical procedure and have your ostomy reversed. So first, you know, it, it, it depends on a lot of different factors. I think it depends on, you know, A, what type of stoma did you have done? Did you have created and can it be reversed? So, you know, do you have the anatomy still there? Do you still have enough, you know, a rectum that you can hold the stool if it's reversed? Is your sphincter still working really well? That way you've got good control so you can release it when you want to. Um, other types of factors just sort of depend on your healing and your overall health. For, so for some of you that might have had uh, a temporary stoma created, maybe due to a cancer diagnosis, and you've gone to, on to have chemotherapy, typically they would wait until all your chemotherapy is done because that affects your healing with your blood cells that you know go up and down with the chemotherapy. They would let you rest and recover for generally about a month after the chemotherapy and then they would reverse it. And just overall good health that you could uh, withstand another surgical procedure um, afterwards. So for successful stoma, I think your team wants to make sure that you're just medically ready uh, to undergo that procedure and have good outcomes afterwards. I'd like to say there's never any complications with surgery, but it always carries uh, a risk uh, for some potential complications. So here you'll see, you know, five of probably the biggest ones, infection, and that could be at your incision site, a little bit of soft tissue infection afterwards. Bleeding is something that can happen. Often that's more of a, of a complication that would happen during the surgery when they're handling the bowel and putting that back together again and reestablishing that continuity. An antistomotic leak is just a big fancy way of saying that uh, the, bow the bowel would leak stool into the abdomen. So when they bring the two ends of the bowel back together again, they call that an anastomosis. That's when they bring the two ends, they uh, clip that or they suture that together again. A leak just means that maybe the bowel, you know, was a little bit fragile. It didn't heal correctly. And so the bowel would, that that incision line would leak a little bit and you get stool contents inside your abdomen. The fourth one there is a bowel obstruction. That's something that can happen as well, you know, during your first surgery as well as this one, um, uh, any blockage of the intestine. And the last one you see there is wound complications such as poor wound healing. So that's why they want you to be in the best, uh, best, um, you know, health possible when they go in to do the reversal. They want to make sure you're going to have good outcomes afterwards. The wound heals really well. Down the road, there's always a risk of an incisional hernia at that site. 
So while these complications are relatively rare, I think it's just important for you to be aware of them. And if maybe you were discharged home after your um, your reversal, if you did you know, experience some of any of these, definitely to reach out to your healthcare team. So a lot of people ask, you know, how is the ostomy reversed? And so, you know, in a very simple way, um, they make an incision, they disconnect the bowel from the surface of the skin, they do the reconnection, and then they close your abdomen. <laughs> so it sounds simple, but it is in their surgical procedure. And the techniques vary. It really depends on what type of stoma you had created uh, initially. So I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, so for some of you uh, in the audience that had a loop stoma created, uh, often when you know a, a stoma is uh, when they're intentionally making a reversible stoma, they'll often do that as a loop. So for example, a loop ileostomy or a loop colostomy. And what the surgeon does is he brings a loop of bowel up. So there's probably a small, you know, there's a small incision site either on your right lower side, your left lower side of your abdomen. They bring a loop of bowel up through that incision site and they only cut through, make an incision halfway through that bowel. So it's not totally disconnected. There's just a small incision halfway through. And if you can imagine this, they're going to sort of turn that over and cuff it over and suture that onto the onto the skin. So when you think about just you know a sleeve of your shirt and how you can cuff that over, when they make that incision in the bowel, they cuff over the two ends and that's uh, stabilized or sutured onto the skin. So through one of those openings, you're gonna have your stool and your gas pass through. And the other opening is just for mucus. And that's what leads down to the rest of your larger small bowel. That's just, we call it defunctioned. It's just rusting because there's nothing going through that. So when a loop stoma is reversed, generally you're only gonna have one incision. And so the surgeon is going to uh, disconnect the stoma or the intestine from the skin edge. So it'll be right where your stoma is. They're going to disconnect that from the skin edge. They're going to mobilize that loop of bowel a wee bit, and they're going to be able to join those two sections back together. So remember, it wasn't fully um, in size all the way through. They'll just bring those two ends back together again. They'll clip that closed or they'll suture it closed put that back down into the abdomen and they'll close the abdominal wall layers. And on the outside, you're gonna see sutures or staples. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. Um, occasionally, there's some of you that maybe had an end stoma done, and those sometimes too can be reversed. But with that type of reversal, you're gonna have probably two incisions on your abdomen afterwards. So um, when a stoma is created as an end, that just means that the surgeon has brought up instead of a loop of bowel through that small incision on either your right lower side, your left lower side, they're gonna bring the end of the bowel up and they're gonna bring that through the abdominal wall. They're gonna cuff that over the same way and suture that on the skin edge, but you only have one opening that you see visible on the surface of your abdomen. And that's where the stool and the gas uh, will, will be um, eliminated from. The other end of your bowel has been sewn over and it's just left, it's just dormant, it's inside the abdomen. But when they go to reverse an end stoma, they would do the same thing kind of at the, at the stoma site. They would detach that from the skin edges. They would mobilize that and free that from the, uh, from the surrounding subcutaneous tissue. They'd also make another small incision, maybe along your midline, and they would just access that, um, that bowel stump or that defunction bowel that's there, and they would reconnect those two ends, and again, put that back inside the abdomen. They close the abdominal wall layers, and they'd suture the skin closed or staple it closed. Now, I'm making that sound very simplistic. You know, there's, you know, a lot more um, dexterity and, um, you know, um, thoughtfulness that goes into it. It's not quite as easy as that. But essentially, those are steps that a surgeon would go through when they go to reverse your ostomy. So for some of you, uh, you know, during your initial surgical procedure, maybe that was pre-planned, maybe that was emergent, you might have had um, trauma that needed to be, um, you know, 
uh, you know, taking care of. It might have been a disease that maybe the surgeon needed to do some resecting, maybe take out some, uh, some, some other organs, you know, if needed. Um, and often that original surgery is a lot longer than what your reversal is. Your reversal is still, is still a hospital stay, it's still general anesthetic, but overall it's a lot of a shorter surgical procedure, a shorter recovery than what the initial surgery is. So I hope that makes you feel a little bit better about what to anticipate if you're eligible to have your ostomy reversed. So, um, Let's say that you've you've had your similar for a little while and the surgeons, you know, discussing about a possible uh, reversal, they're going to do some imaging, some tests first. So again, you know, we want to make sure you're in the right uh, position to have that reversed. So some of these tests could include a blood test and we have those for lots of reasons all the time. It gives us an idea what our blood counts are, what our organ function is, just kind of general health is a nice way of looking at that. You'll probably have some imaging done. They'll order some CT scans or maybe an MRI. We'll talk about this a little bit more too, just to see the, uh, you know, the condition and the integrity of the intestine and your abdomen in general. And they're going to do a rectal exam. You might be wondering, why would they do that? So for some of you that have had your stoma, it might have been for maybe two or three months, or maybe you've had it for six or nine or 12 months. What the surgeon wants to do is check your rectal tone. He wants to make sure that you've got good sphincter control so that when they do do the reversal, you're going to have continence. You're going to be able to hold your stool and um, and not have you know accident, you know fecal accidents or incontinence. So they'll do that rectal exam just to make sure you've got good control over that to hold the stool as well as the gas. And they'll do a scope as well just to make sure that the in the remaining part of the intestine is well healed um, before they do the reversal. Now, a lot of people tend to worry about a scope and hopefully I can maybe shed some light on that with you, make you feel a little bit better. So depending on where your stoma is, if you have, um, you know, a colostomy, if that's made kind of at the at the end of your colon, if it's a little bit higher up, if it's an ileostomy, that will really determine what type of scope that you have done. But this is the surgeon's way of actually getting in there and visually checking to make sure that bowel incision is well healed and that you're ready for a reversal. The last thing they want is a complication to have you get sick. So they wanna make sure that incision line is well healed and that it can support having gas and stool go through that again. So if you've had um, maybe a colostomy or your, uh, you know, your stoma is sort of in the lower end of the, of the colon, you might only need a flexible sigmoidoscopy. Whereas if you've had maybe, you know, an ileostomy done, they might do more of a colonoscopy where they'll put the camera, you know, further up just to, to be able to access that site to make sure it's okay. So these tests are generally done, you know, four to five weeks before surgery, just to make sure everything looks A-OK, -okay, and then they would book you for surgery. The other test that many surgeons will do is a contrast enema. So again, this is another kind of visual check to make sure that incision line is well healed. So where they removed the disease, they brought the two ends of the bowel back together again. Uh, a contrast enema, the test that they do where they put, um, you know, contrast is a small tube that goes um, up your bottom, just above the, the rectal sphincter. And they're going to slowly release about a liter, liter of fluid into the large bowel. And they'll have you roll from side to side. And the contrast will illuminate if there's any, um, if there's any separation in that incision line, if we're, you know, possibly down the road, stool could maybe, you know, get out from um, the, the, the barium enema or the contrast enema would just show if there's any leakage in that bowel incision line, uh, it would show on the x-ray that maybe, you know, they needed to wait and pause, and let you heal a little bit more before they do that reversal. So again, this one could be done four to five weeks before surgery. Both are very valuable tests to make sure that bowel incision line uh, has healed entirely before they do re your reversal. So hopefully that makes you feel a little bit more comfortable with those. Of course, you know, the, the contrast enemas, I think, and the colonoscopies are never pleasant, but it's their visual check to make sure that everything is healing the way that it should. And so let's say you get through the conversation with your surgeon. He says, yep, you can have the reversal. You're eligible. You've done all the tests. Everything looks great. I think it's good for you to really consider, you know, do you want it reversed? So it really, so what I want you to think about is, you know, 
are you are you wanting another surgery? So remember those risks I showed you before on an earlier slide. It is another general anesthetic. So for some people, they don't handle that very well. They can have some uh, some complications afterwards, maybe a little bit of confusion. For some people, you know, maybe the risk of that surgery, they'd rather not go through it and they'd rather continue with their pouch and that's okay. I think a really good conversation and question to ask to your surgeon is, how much of the bowel did you remove? So what sections of the bowel, small bowel, large bowel, how much was removed and what will my bowel movements be like? So you know the function of your large bowel is to reabsorb water and that's how you typically have soft form stools. If you've had a lot of your large bowel removed, uh, you're not gonna have that same water reabsorption. So your bowel movements will be a little bit more liquidy, a little bit more um, you know, pasty maybe, and they're gonna be more frequent. So I think it's good to ask your doctor, your surgeon, you know, how much of the of the bowel did you remove? And then what do you think my bowel movements are gonna be like? And um, just to, to make sure you're making an informed decision, I'll tell you honestly, when you know the bowel is resected, I don't think many people go back to normal bowel routines. I think there's always a little bit of, uh, of difference that people noticed um, from before surgery to after. And that can be, you know, significant for some people if they've had a lot of, a lot of bowel removed. And I'll talk about that in just a little, in just a little, in a few minutes. Um, the other thing to consider is how well you're handling your ostomy. So for some of you that are listening to me today and maybe you've had your stoma created due to inflammatory bowel disease. And so you've lived through the urgency, the frequency, and then needing to go to a washroom right away, maybe fecal incontinence as well. Um, for those of you too that might be listening and maybe you've had uh, a fistula. So for some women, something that can happen is um, a, 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 like a large bowel to vagina. We call that a colovaginal fistula, where maybe you had stool seeping through the vagina. And so you had a lot of incontinence. You had a lot of skin irritation from that. Maybe for, you know, some people having the pouch has given them a new life. You know, they've got, you know, continents where maybe they never had that before. Maybe that's a lot easier to handle and manage than, you know, running to the washroom and knowing where your public washrooms are. It's a very, very personal decision. So uh, for some people, um, you know, they, they tell me, I'm just going to keep my stoma. You know, I'm, I've am i learned how to adapt to it and I can handle my pouch well. I'm changing it once or twice a week. It's so much easier then before they might decide they just want to keep it because it's really added to their quality of life. And I think, you know, thinking about the demands of your job. So I, I think when they reverse the stoma, um, no surgeon can definitely say to you exactly what your bowel movements are going to be like afterwards. Um, that's something that you're going to find out when you kind of cross that bridge and you're on the other side and you're recovering and you've, um, spent some time adjusting to that revision and that reversal and you know what your bowel movements are going to be like. So for some people, if they have a job where it's um, easy to get to the washroom, then it's not an issue. If you're um, somebody that maybe has a little bit more frequent stool, maybe a little bit more urgency after the reversal, if you have a nearby washroom, you know, available either, you know, definitely always at home, but at work or when you're out, uh, that makes a big difference as well. Sometimes people that travel, that can make a difference too, if they've got a lot of urgency and frequency after the reversal is done. And I think for some of the people, you know, I live in Ontario and we don't have 100% coverage for our ostomy supplies. So that also kind of plays into um, you know, the decision as well, because there isn't 100% coverage. So for some people, you know, they would like to try the reversal just to see if, um, uh, if that's just a little bit easier than trying to juggle the cost of the ostomy equipment. So lots of variables to sort of consider if you're thinking about the reversal and uh, definitely discuss that, you know, with your doctor, with your support group, like Ostomy Canada, people around you that have had a reversal done to see if, if that's something that you think is right for you. One thing I always tell people before the reversal is done is that, you know, the pelvic floor exercises. So I think, um, you know, this is one of the best tips and advice I can give for, uh, you know, a more successful recovery afterwards is to begin these pelvic floor exercises as soon as your healthcare team, like your surgeon advises. 
So again, since having your stoma, you haven't been using your rectum as a storage vault, right? That's what it does is it stores stool until you're ready to go or your sphincter, which, you know, kind of helps you with uh, voluntarily releasing that when you want to. All of those muscles in your rectum and in your sphincter have kind of been on vacation since you've had the stoma. So they need to be um, you know, exercised again and just get that muscle tone back. So it gives you good control afterwards. Um, when we think about pelvic floor, you know, I think this is something that's gaining more and more momentum. There's even pelvic floor physiotherapists now uh, that have just a, an entire specialty that's made up with pelvic floor exercises. So, um, you know, in order to have control and continence after surgery, you need to exercise these muscles. And I think um, you know, it's very good even as we age, just that, uh, that core group of muscles in, in your pelvis. Um, I think a lot of people think that the pelvic muscle or the pelvic floor is just one muscle. But if you can think of this diagram here, it shows almost a basket weave. It is an inter layering and a meshing together of different muscle groups that gives you that continence uh, for bowel and for stool, also for, um, for your organs as well. So for some people that have prolapses, the pelvic floor muscles are very important as well. And not just for women. I think sometimes there's this idea that pelvic floor uh, exercises are just for women, but they're also for men in terms of how we age and just keeping that um, that um, uh, inner core nice and strong to, uh, to protect our organs. So um, I think for those of you that have a temporary stoma and you're planning a reversal, um, an efficient pelvic or an effective pelvic floor will be essential for you to maintain your, your bowel control after surgery. For some of you that have a permanent stoma, so maybe you're listening today and you know that your stoma isn't one of those that can be reversed, it's going to be permanent. These pelvic floor exercises I'm going to show to you are actually very good for yourself as well. They're good for uh, your, your, your urinary continence, for example. They're good for your posture and just preventing back injuries down the road. So I hope that uh, all all of you will find these uh, very helpful. So Kegel exercises, I think the word Kegel and pelvic floor is used a little bit interchangeably. Um, it was actually Arnold Kegel who first documented pelvic floor exercises back in 1948. And since then, um, you know, the, the idea of pelvic floor physiotherapy and core muscle group strengthening has just really um, accelerated through, the, I think, um, you know, rehabilitation and just successful aging. So that's where the word Kegel came from. It was actually Arnold Kegel. And so this is one of the first exercises that he did. So I'm going to show you four different exercises and we're going to talk a little bit about how these are done. And these are something you could, you know, do um, as soon as you're, uh, if you're, it's a reversal that you're looking at, as soon as your healthcare team or your surgeon says it's okay. Or if maybe you've um, you know, you have a permanent stoma, you can start these anytime. But the Kegel exercises, the best way to do these ones here are to do it really slowly because it helps to have good control over several muscle groups in your pelvic floor when you're doing these. And there's definitely modifications. So if you're not able to do all of these, uh, there's modifications that a physiotherapist can help you uh, to do just so you get, um, you know, good control uh, when you're doing them. But with the Kegel exercise, is, you know, you could do these either laying down or you could do them sitting, but you're going to squeeze those muscles around your anus as if you're trying to hold back uh, gas or stool. And you're going to squeeze really hard and try to elevate that up and in. You're going to hold that contraction for about five seconds, and then you're going to slowly release that for five seconds as well. So again, it's that controlled movement. If you could do this 10 times um, in a cycle, three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening. That's something that's going to help to strengthen your, uh, your pelvic core. The other good exercise is a bridge pose. And this does take some mobility. And again, and again there's modifications that can be done. But this one strengthens your core, if it all strengthens your buttocks as, as well. And by strengthening your buttocks, it helps to support your, your lower back and your, uh, and your pelvic floor. So typically, you would lay down on your back and you would press your, you'd have your knees bent and you'd press your feet flat into the floor. And again, very slowly, like in a controlled way, you would lift your hips up off the ground and you try to create a straight line between your hips and your knees. 
and you're going to hold this position, you know, for a few seconds if you can, and then slowly lower back down to the ground. And this is something you could repeat in a cycle of 10 to 15 times. Again, aiming for uh, three sets a day if you could. The next exercise is squats, and uh, this is something that you do in a standing position. Again, it's done really slowly, and this is to help um, contract the pelvic floor um, during the movement without compensating through other muscles um, in, your, in your abdomen. So you're gonna stand with your uh, feet shoulder width apart and your toes uh, uh, pointed just slightly outwards, and you're gonna lower your body down as if you're sitting back into a chair but I want you to make sure you keep your, your bum kind of you know, tilted out a wee bit and you go all the way down, keep your heels on the ground and your, and your knees kind of aligned and you're gonna come back up again. So again, nice and slow, it burns a little bit when you're going down and it's a little bit easier when you go back up. But this is gonna to help to isolate some of those pelvic floor um, muscles and you're gonna do this for a repetition if you could, 10 to 15 times and then several times a day if that's possible. And the last one I'm going to show you is a pelvic tilt. And this is something that you would do when you're laying down. And this moves help you, helps you to engage and strengthen your abdominal muscles. It can also help with the mobility of your lower back as well. So it can be done laying on the floor if you wanted, or maybe in the bed in the morning before you get up. But you'll lie on your back with your knees bent and flat on the floor. And normally when you're in this position, you're going to feel a little hollowing of, the, of your lower back. And what I want you to try to do is flatten your lower back uh, flat against the floor, and you're going to gently rotate your pelvis upwards. And again, it's a very slow, controlled movement. You're going to hold that for a few seconds and then release your pelvis back down into a more neutral position. And doing this again 10 to 15 times, just very, very slowly, um, and then uh, releasing that down. And again, doing this uh, three times a day if possible. So when it comes to um, you know the tips for successful recovery, we all want you to have a great recovery after surgery. I think you got to know from the beginning you're one of the most important people in that recovery process. So um, you know depending on how you had your surgery or your stoma created, why you had it created, follow your, sur your surgeon's instructions regarding any uh, you know preoperative diet you need to follow, any medications. Or preparation before your before your your surgeon or before me before your surgery. Again, the pelvic floor exercises they're key. They're key as we get older. They're key before surgery, just to make sure we can support our internal organs. And staying active, you know, within the limitations uh, that you're able to. I think for some people now, um, you know, just to help optimize them to get them in the best position before surgery. Some of our surgeons are even re uh, um, uh, referring people for prehabilitation. So for some of you, you've heard of, you know, rehabilitation afterwards. You've had your surgery, but you go somewhere to rehabilitate to get stronger so you're safe to go home afterwards. Prehabilitation is done before surgery and it's meant to sort of optimize you that you can meet with a dietitian to sort of you know look at your diet, make sure you're 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 as healthy and your intake is as good as it can be physiotherapy as well to make sure that you're as active as you can be, you're safely moving, you know, within your limited within your limitations. That's something that your surgeon might refer you to as well. It's something that uh, some centers are doing. And then I think attending any preoperative counseling or support groups is really key because I think the decision to have an ostomy reversal is a big one. And I think speaking to people that have been through it uh, they will definitely give you some good advice and it gives you a forum that you can ask questions to definitely your healthcare providers. Uh, but if they had any uh, counseling available, it's nice to sort of access that. That way you're going in uh, with all your questions answered. So what to expect when you're in the hospital? Um, just like your first surgery, if you had something that, if you had a surgery that was, um, you know, elective before or it was pre-planned, you'll check in your preoperative care unit. The surgery for the reversal takes about two hours and then you're going to go, so it's a shorter duration. You're going to go to the post-operative care unit or the recovery unit and then you'll be eventually transferred to your room. So the length of stay really depends. It depends on uh, your pain. It depends on how quickly you're up and you're moving around. And of course, how quickly things are moving 
uh, through your digestive tract. So initially, they'll wait until you're passing gas before they'll start fluids. With some surgical programs, if they're on um, something called ERAS, uh, enhanced recovery after surgery, they might start you a little bit sooner. But generally, they'll start you on just fluids, um, then they'll progress you to full fluids and then onto a low residue diet. I'll talk about that in just a minute. To go home, you really need to be able to, you know, eat well, pass a bowel movement per rectum and have that done successfully. Eating and drinking well, just so you're, you're nourished, you're, you're uh, hydrated when you go home, your pain is well controlled. And I want you to know that when that reversal is initially done and you're having that reconnection or that continuity of your bowel, it's not uncommon to have mucus leakage, some cramping, some urgency. So remember like part of that bowel hasn't been used in a little while, nor the rectum, nor the sphincter. So as stool is coming down that digestive tract, it's not uncommon to have some leakage and some uh, urgency around that. So a lot of people ask you, what is my old ostomy site going to look like? And, you know, I think techniques vary in our hospital. Uh, two techniques are typically done that I see. One is a suture. So uh, it's usually not sutured entirely closed. Uh, they suture that closed somewhat, but then it's allowed to drain. There might be a little bit of packing that's in there for a few days, maybe a week. It heals from the bottom up to the top. We call that by secondary intention from the inside out and then it's closed over. The other technique is some surgeons, when they close the bowel and they, they reverse the stoma, they might just close your incision site on your abdomen with some staples. And that's the picture you see there right in the middle. Um, once both of those are healed, the final picture that you'll see there on the bottom um, right or left-hand side is one of a, of a healed surgical um, incision from where a stoma used to be. So it's kind of that pink silvery color, uh, could be flush with the skin, might be a little bit elevated. That's typically what it looks like, you know, um, you know, months to a year down the road once everything is healed uh, and that, uh, that scar tissue has formed. Now what you expect in the first few days when you go home, it is going to be an adjustment. So I want you to be patient as your bowel adapts. I think um, the urgency and the frequency, you know, if you've gone to any support groups or talked about people, that's something that definitely happens. Again, I think depending on how long um, you've had your stoma for, um, if it's only been a couple of months, you might not experience too much of this because maybe you still have really good control over your rectum and your sphincter. If you're having your reversal done months and months and months or a year, you know, after your initial stoma creation, you might have some more urgency and frequency as you retrain that bowel. And so that's not uncommon. Um, so the symptoms really vary too, based on how much and what part of the bowel was resected. So that's good to know before surgery. Um, I, I think depending on, um, um, on your surgical procedure is not uncommon to maybe to have bowel movements 10 or 15 times a day. I, you know, I don't mean to scare you, but I just want you to know that it could be uh, a little bit more frequent initially. What you need to do is try to retrain uh, the sphincter in the bowel. So as that stool now is kind of passing through for the first time and you're having those sensations, try to hold it as long as you can. That's how you're going to regain that sphincter control control before you go to the washroom. And something that you might have difficulty um, discerning to is gas versus stool. So you're going to feel some pressure in your rectum and you might think, is that gas? Is that stool? I'm not really too sure. Go to the bathroom just to make sure it's not, it's not, um, it's not more than just gas. Um, and I think with time, you'll, you'll be able to decipher that once again, I think, um, you know, there's definitely a different type of sensation if that's gas that's sort of moving through that you need to express or if it's stool, but uh, that will come with time. So just, uh, you know, be patient with yourself uh, and let that happen. And often when you go to the washroom and you're bearing down uh, to urinate, you might have a little bit of stool pass too. And it's just because you're using that, that bearing down um, uh, forces. And again, if your sphincter isn't totally, you know, back to normal yet, 
with that bearing down sensation, you might pass a little bit of stool too, and that's okay. That's to be expected. You'll hopefully get that back again, but um, it will be a little bit more initially at the beginning. And a good thing, I wrote it here on this slide and I also put it on another slide, but using you know, a pad or sanitary napkin, position more at the back of the underwear is really good. That way, if there is a little bit of leakage, if you're you know, having that urgency initially and you're running to the washroom, you've got a little bit of, of, um, of support there with the a sanitary napkin or a pad just to collect any leakage that uh, that could occur and so um, if I could give you a list of tushy tips is what I call it uh, before surgery you want to be prepared especially you know if you're somebody that lives alone and you don't have a lot of resources around you. Uh, this is sort of some things I go through with, with my patients that I'll extend to all of you today. But I think when you're um, getting ready for that reversal, just making sure that you've got some sanitary napkins at home. Uh, the extra long ones are great. There are some that have a dovetail at the back. I'm not too sure the manufacturer that if it's always or what the brand name is, but it dovetails up a wee bit. So it gives you a little bit more coverage around your bottom, which is good. Having a really good barrier cream that is zinc based is going to be uh, super helpful at home. You can imagine going to the bathroom numerous times a day and the burning that's going to happen. So uh, get a good zinc based cream and you're going to put that on after each bowel movement. Buy soft toilet paper. So it sounds um, it sounds kind of silly, but you know, it, in the hospital we have a one ply is very very rough. If you're going to the washroom, you know, super often at home, investing in some soft toilet paper will make a lot of difference for you. And I think sometimes when you are cleaning after a bowel movement, um, there are peri cleanse bottles that will sometimes give to people in the hospital. So you can think of like just a little bottle that you can squirt over over that area, so it allows you to clean it without rubbing. And I think definitely, you know, dabbing the area versus a wipe is a little bit easier too, just so you're eliminating any friction uh, on the area. For those of you that have a bidet in your home, that's going to be super helpful. Um, that's, uh, that could be nice for you to have too. And sometimes having sit spa, so those are little basins you can get to go uh, in the toilet that you can just sort of, you know, soak your bottom in. You will find that very soothing. And food modification, as I mentioned earlier about a low residue diet, have some of those foods in your home and ready to go after surgery, just so that aids with uh, with your recovery um, afterwards. You're not having to go out grocery shopping uh, as you're as you're recovering from your surgery. So the purpose of a low residue diet is just to have smaller and frequent bowel movements. So you can imagine if you've got a little bit of urgency and frequency, depending on how much bowel was, re was removed, if it's a little bit more liquid, if you had a whole lot of fi high fiber foods, that just might make it a little bit more active. So with the low residue diet, it's, you know, we cut back on um, uh, the, the whole grains, um, the fresh fruits and vegetables. We look for things that generally have less than a, you know, one gram of fiber per serving. And this is only temporary until your bowel adapts. So I think for some of you that had a loop ileostomy created during part of your initial surgery, you remember the pamphlet the dietitian gave to you. This is the exact same thing. Remember, it's just temporary and it's just meant to help get some more control over those bowel movements and slow them down a little bit. So what you can eat is all the white food. So remember your white bread, your white pasta, your rice, bananas, potatoes, all those things that will just help to add starch and some consistency to your bowel movements. Uh, good things too are like pretzels and peanut butter that helps just to thicken things a little bit. I did put cheese and yogurt on here because that is allowed, but if you're somebody that's more lactose intolerant, you might want to think differently about that one. Definitely any tender meats are fine, eggs, tofu, and then drinking lots of water just so you're keeping hydrated um, with, your, um, with your diet. So when it comes to the low residue diet, it's important to follow sort of certain dietary restrictions because we want to promote healing. We want to minimize your discomfort. We want to support the bowel function. So these are some loose guidelines that are commonly recommended after reversal. So the first, like we just talked about, is starting with a low residue diet. So again, advised just to kind of ease that transition and reduce the workload on the digestive system. <clears throat> involves like consuming the low fiber foods, cooked vegetables without skins, tender meats, you know, all of that is okay. 
And then gradually as your bowel adapts and you're having less bowel movements, maybe they're a little bit, you know, firmer consistency, you can gradually increase that, um, uh, that fiber back into your diet again. Fiber, you know, is very helpful um, in fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains to help regulate bowel movements and to promote bowel health. So I think once we have that initial urgency and frequency slowed down, begin to add in the fiber again bit by bit, um, just very, very slowly. We don't want to overwhelm your system, but just to reintroduce those foods again. Staying hydrated is just, uh, you know, drink plenty of water throughout the day to keep you hydrated. And again, as your stool does maybe get a little bit more pastier down the road, it helps prevent uh, or probably to promote uh, healthy bowel movements. And you're going to want to watch your trigger food. So everybody is a little bit different. We're all made uh, somewhat uh, differently from one another. There's certain foods that you might find just, you know, cause discomfort, gas, diarrhea. As you come across those foods, you can make a written note of that, maybe a mental note. That's something that you just want to uh, to try to stay away from a little bit. Everyone is a, is a little bit different, so um, you'll have to see what your system is like. And you want to try to avoid those foods that just, you know, exacerbate the symptoms. Some of the, the triggering foods, too, can be caffeine and alcohol, so you'll just have to see uh, uh, what you're like. Definitely chewing your foods uh, well. Eating very slowly is good. For some people, separating the fluids from the meals also helps to slow down the digestion. So if you're having a lot of frequent bowel movements and you're trying to slow things down, if you were to, you know, not have that glass of water or milk, you know, along with your meals, maybe separate that a wee bit. It slows down the transit time. For some people, having more smaller frequent meals is a little bit easier uh, to digest, literally, than having larger meals that just put more strain and overwhelms the system a little bit more. And of course, if you're really struggling, you know, working with a dietitian is something that you might have access to through your, through your surgeon that can give you some personalized guidance, you know, meal planning that's just tailored to your specific needs and to your tolerances. And just remember that all these recommendations that I've, I've mentioned here, just they vary depending on individual factors, you know, based on the type of ostomy that you had, your overall health, your specific surgical consideration. So it's really important that you reach out to your healthcare team, especially the dietitian, if you're having concerns after your reversal. And then help at your fingertips. So I think for those of you that use smartphones, there is so much available now. It's just I'm always uh, intrigued when I go searching for new things that can help people and just how companies are engineering things for people to be successful. So on the far left hand side of your screen, there are just two pelvic floor exercise apps that I came across. Um, one is tailored more for men is a men's health app, because remember, these are also made for men. And then another, just a Kegel trainer that, uh, that you know, is more unisex that anybody could use. Right in the middle of the screen there, you're going to see a, uh, apps that will display nearby public washrooms. So I think this is key, if you, even if you have a stoma, because sometimes you, you can't be certain exactly when you're going to need to empty your pouch, but knowing where your public washrooms are around you, there's different apps that you can download. And there's even some that are like specific for where you're traveling. If you're going to Rome, I found one for Rome. There was one for, I think, Venice, but, um, or just general ones like these ones that will, you know, be able to identify where you're located and then where your washrooms are around you. And so for people who have a reversal and maybe you're just, you know, sort of getting your socialization, you know, back, you're feeling more comfortable going out and about, knowing where your public washrooms are, I think it's just such a, a peace of mind that if you did have sort of some urgency, you had to get to a washroom, you knew where to, where to go. And the other thing on the far right hand side there is the symptom trackers. So when we think about, you know, the reversal and so you might have some, you know, um, abdominal discomfort, there could be some gas, um, there could be, um, you know, bouts of diarrhea or some food intolerances. Keeping track of your symptoms is really important. So even if you didn't have a smart uh, a smartphone or an app to use, charting this down, you know, for your surgeon is very, very helpful. Again, right after surgery, when you have the reversal done, depending on, you know, your procedure, you might have, you know, very frequent bowel movements. It could be 10 or 12 times a day. The next week it might go down to maybe eight to 10, then maybe down to six. And you'll see progression, which is very nice to sort of see that trajectory that you're getting some, you know, some um, 
bowel uh, regularity back and some uh, some control over that. But I think if you're one of those people that maybe you're still really struggling with those uh, those symptoms after surgery, having a diary to take into a physician, into your surgeon to say, you know, look, I'm still really struggling. This isn't, you know, settling the way that I thought it would. It would give them a good baseline of what your bowel um, history is like, and then they might want to start you on some medication. So very important to do. And then of course, as you're at home too, you're going to continue with your pelvic floor exercises. This is just two of the four that I showed you, but even after your surgery, just, you know, really helping to get that pelvic floor muscle strengthened for control and continence afterwards. And so in conclusion, uh, today we've talked about ostomy reversal and that it's a procedure that could be offered to some people living with an ostomy. It's not a possibility for everybody, but it's a very personal and individual decision. So we talked about just, you know, some of those factors why you may or may not want that reversed, even if it is a possibility. And then I think to speak to your healthcare team and just your support systems around you uh, for more information, for guidance on making that, um, on that recovery. And then um, just, you know, as you move forward, you'll be that, that person for somebody else. So I hope that you have found this, um, this presentation very helpful and enlightening, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Amazing. Well, first of all, I just want to say an absolute thank you again to you, uh, uh, Deborah, for being able to put on this presentation and again for Hollister to, for making this possible today. We do, in fact, have some questions. We had quite a few submissions that came in before the webinar, and we, I do see, see that we had quite a few that came in during the webinar. So maybe I'll start off with a, with a couple here to get us going, and we'll see how many we can get to. Um, so one of the questions uh, is surrounding, uh, you know, how many or how often do you uh, typically know that ostomy surgeries are reversed? And, and in addition to that question, how long after having a colostomy could a reversal even take place? It's a good question, and, and I wish I had firm numbers for you, but I don't. Uh, I think um, we so the number of ostomies are reversed. I think it really depends on the disease process and why you had it created. I can tell you right now uh, with the information from the disability tax credit, I think there's about 130, 140,000 people across Canada that have been living with a stoma for greater than 12 months uh, to get that disability tax credit. Some of those people are definite uh, permanent stomas. Some of those may have had reversible stomas, but opted to keep them. But I don't know the stats in Canada of how many of those stomas are reversed. I think sometimes uh, even if the anatomy is there, some people might choose to keep the pouch because it just gives them more quality of life. So I don't have that number for you. Um, I think too, when you, the second part of your question was just when can that happen? Again, it really depends on your health. It depends on why you had the stoma created. So for some people, um, they, might, they might have the reversal done in uh, two to three months. For some people, if they need to get through chemotherapy. So if they had that stoma created maybe because of an oncology diagnosis, and so part of their treatment plan is having the surgery for the stoma and then going through chemotherapy, they'd have to wait until that's done. So that could be, depending on how many cycles, that could be 12 uh, months, could be six months. It really just depends. I think at our site, the longest reversal that I have seen has been about a year and a half. So there could be other centers that reverse them after that point, but I think it really depends on your personal situation and how comfortable your surgeon feels doing it. Perfect. Well, thank you for touching yeah. on that a, a little bit there. And one of the other questions that we have coming in here, for, we're talking about, um, about emergency surgery. One person was asking about having an uh, emergency surgery due, uh, due to a ruptured bowel and di I diverticulitis. Uh, considering reversal and wondering if they are likely to experience more diver diverticul diverticulitis if reversed. Yeah. Sorry, it's a tough word. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so for those of you that don't know what diverticulitis is, it's often something that happens in a large bowel. And what happens is people form these little inward uh, pockets or these little bulges in their large intestine. And so some of us may have these right now and we don't know because they're, we're asymptomatic. But for some people, if they get inflamed, that's when you get diverticulitis. And depending on if that gets abscessed, if there's infection that's there, sometimes if it doesn't settle down with antibiotics, there may be a bowel resection that's needed. So in terms of would you 
likely have that again. I don't know. I think your surgeon would be the best one to ask. Doing uh, those scopes that we talked about before, they'd be able to see with the colonoscopy if there's any more diverticuli along your large bowel. Sometimes with diet, they may never flare up. Um, some people, like I said, have them for years and they, they just don't even know that they're there. You could ask your surgeon what he thinks is a likelihood of that. When he did the resection for your stoma, he might have taken out the whole area of colon where he found the diverticuli and maybe that's all there is. If there's other ones, maybe further up the, the large bowel, maybe ask him, get his uh, opinion. Definitely having reversal won't, uh, won't stimulate that, it won't cause it. But if you did have a couple of diverticuli still there, then maybe with diet modifications uh, that might be uh, less likely to be triggered and inflamed. Perfect. Well, thank you for yeah. touching on that. And I know towards the end of the presentation, of course, we're talking a lot about diet, we're talking about recovery time and all that kind of stuff there. Would you mind just touching again on um, what the rough recovery time is overall? I know some people are talking about how much time might I have to take off work? Um, how long do you typically see uh, for people to gain normal control over the bowel movement? And does it kind of depend on how long you might have had your ostomy for beforehand? Yeah, that's a great question. I think people ask me that all the time, and I wish I had a magic an like a, a, an answer for everybody. I think it depends on how long you've had your stoma for. So if you've had um, a stoma and your rectum and your sphincter hasn't been used for a long time, regaining that control again is going to take more effort for you than somebody uh, that that has had it just for a short period. I think depending on what type, what part of your bowel was resected. So if you're somebody that's had a large piece of your large bowel resected, um, when you have your reversal done, uh, you're going to have some urgency and frequency. And some of that will be your new normal. So I don't think I've met very many people that even have had a smaller bowel resection that have, you know, recovered and said, I'm back to totally normal. There's always, you know, differences in their bowel routines. Um, going back to work and how much time you need off work, that is so individual. I think it depends on how well you're recovering, what your bowel movements are like. Um, it is just, it's very, very personal. It's very individual for different people. So you could speak to your surgeon about that. Hopefully, if you were having a lot of side effects afterwards, uh, you know, they would definitely give you a longer period of time off just to allow you to adapt and just let that bowel to heal. But I don't have a firm answer. Everybody is a little bit different. No problem. We know that's probably going to be the case with a lot of these questions. And um, yeah. one of the questions that someone did ask about is, is about what, what do I do if I have questions? I need to speak to an ostomy uh, specialist. I know we put in our chat about our find an, an NSWOC tool that does exist on the Ostomy Canada Society website. But um, um, is there any anything that you might recommend to someone who are just having a lot of questions here? What are what are some things they might need to uh, bring forward to an ostomy specialist or an NSWOC uh, when they first go in? Um, one mm -hmm. person was recommending they, they keep a, a, a food diary, for example, to keep an idea of, of, of how, um, you know, how things are going with their diet um, afterwards. Is there any recommendations you would make as an NSWOC yourself that might help that interaction when you go to see your ostomy specialist? Oh, so um, I think the poo diary is a great idea, especially for your surgeon. So if you're somebody that's really struggling with a lot of um, urgency and frequency afterwards, and you might have heard of some people that... Uh, experience uh, low, low anterior resection syndrome. So they're having a lot of urgency and frequency and it just doesn't settle down. Having that diary is going to be something the surgeon can look at and prescribe medication, maybe different things. I think for us at that point as an NSWOC, um, you might have, um, so mo some, some hospitals, I shouldn't say all, but um, some of the bigger centers that do a lot more of the ostomies, they will have an NSWOC uh, within their surgical program. So if you'd reach out to the hospital, we had your surgery done to see if there's one in the hospital that you could speak to. I think your idea about contacting Ostomy Canada is beautiful because you can search for your area. Maybe there wasn't one in the hospital where you were at, but there could be one in the community that you can link up with to get some tips and tricks. I think too, if, if you're really struggling after surgery, um, some of the surgeons will have a dietitian that you can speak with postoperatively just to see if there's any diet uh, modifications that you can make. They might link you up with a pelvic floor physiotherapist just for exercises to help strengthen. 
and then uh, maybe start you on medication as well. So I think the NSWOC is kind of one piece of that puzzle and you should be able to find somebody through Ostomy Canada uh, if there isn't somebody through your local hospital, but it might be a little bit beyond us depending on how severe the, the the, the frequency is and the bowel movements, it might be more of a surgical issue you need to take to a doctor, maybe not surgical, but more of a medical issue that you need medications for and they might be better able to help. Perfect, okay, well, thank you for touching on that. We'll see if we can get to a couple more questions here before we head out. Um, you mentioned again in one of your presentations about fistulas and, and have, have you heard of or do you know anything about whether fistulas might grow back after uh, a reversal? Yeah, so that's very common with uh, people that uh, have Crohn's disease. So maybe some of some of you in the audience today might have Crohn's, and as you know, that's an inflammatory disease of your entire digestive system. But very often with Crohn's people, they will develop fistulae that are perianal or anal fistulae. That can be very uh, painful. Sometimes they're managed with just um, you know rest and medications. Sometimes there needs to be a surgery done. I don't know about if you had a stoma created for that and you had it reversed, what the likelihood would be that you would develop another fistula again. I think it really depends on your disease process, um, what medications that you're on, and uh, definitely speak to your surgeon about that. He might be best to guide you uh, that if that was, you know, the bowel continuity was reestablished and another fistula occurred, what the next steps would be after that. So I think uh, it's something that could possibly happen, but your surgeon and your gastroenterologist might be the best person to ask, you know, should I have the reversal done? Was the likelihood that that could redevelop again? Because I think with Crohn's, there's always a possibility that that may happen, whether it happened in the same spot or a different location, maybe or maybe not, but I think those involved in your care would give you the best answers for um, uh, for decision making on that. Okay, well, thank you for letting us know there. We'll go uh, maybe two last questions here. Uh, this one's sort of a, a bit uh, two, two part here. Um, and sorry, I completely lost it here. Uh, I'm so sorry, here we go. Um, so one of the questions here is about potential compl uh, complications or risks. And someone was asking about, um, would they be a, a candidate still in, in your estimation if they have had quite a few abdominal surgeries or a lot of scar tissue or adhesions uh, in, in the past? Uh, they've been able to uh, handle their stomach very well, um, but they, they're, they're wondering about the risk or some of the complications that might come, especially with a col colostomy re reversal. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think, um, so adhesions for people that are kind of wondering what that is, it's, it's bands of scar tissue that form between our organs or within the loops of bowel that we have. I had a surgeon one time uh, describe it as cobwebbing and I thought that is a great analogy. I'm going to use that. But you can imagine, you know, spider webs or cobwebs kind of holding the organs together. Um, generally, these will happen after any surgery because it's part of the recovery process. Some you never have complications or you don't know that they're there. Other people, if there's a lot of scar tissue and a lot of adhesions that happen, the bowel becomes, I wouldn't say stuck, but it's very difficult to get those loops of bowel for reversal because everything is kind of tethered together. So I think in that case, um, the reversal is going to have higher risks because it's not as easy to get at those pieces of bowel, whether it's uh, an end stoma that you have and a stump that's inside to reverse that, or if it's a loop, it comes a lot more risks because the surgeon wouldn't want to accidentally uh, cause them they call it enterotomy, but it's like uh, a hole in part of the bowel or trauma to part of the bowel that might cause complications down the way. So I think it definitely does carry a lot more risks. I think your surgeon would be able to give you um, more advice on that. But if you've had your stoma and it's been years and you're managing well, maybe you might be one of those people that just decide keeping a stoma is a better option for me. I don't want to take the risks of more complications during surgery and managing with my stoma well. Even if you have stoma issues, there's definitely NSWOCs out there. That if you're not having length, like the wear time or the um, if you have any skin ir irritation, linking with an NSWOC can maybe make that a better experience for you. But I think circling back to your uh, your surgeon to see if a reversal is possible, they'd be best to ask that, to answer that, pardon me. Perfect, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna give you one last question and then we'll kind of wrap it up here a little bit and I'll, I'll let everybody know about where you can find some resources again afterwards. But mm -hmm. the last one is about uh, the skin and recovering from the surgery um, afterwards. So a lot of people are asking, 
I know you talked about this at the beginning of the webinar, but about how long that, that wound sometimes takes to heal post-surgery. Post is it common for it to take a, a little while? Um, and is there any kind of recommendation you would make to people about making sure that uh, it heals properly afterwards? Oh, is this for the stoma site? I think it's called the stoma site. site. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They're going to be amazed at how quickly that heals. So, uh, for those people that have a suture and it's left open to drain a wee bit, it might be in my center. I've seen it maybe, you can, if you can imagine, like a centimeter long, half a centimeter wide, a little bit of packing in there, but it heals very quickly from the bottom up to the top. So, you might have that for a couple of weeks. For those people that are closed, um, you know, completely and then their incision line is stapled at the top, um, that is, uh, you know, pretty much, the, you know, in a couple of days are able to shower and do different things. We tell people in terms of showering, you know, when you have an open incision like that, if you, you might want to wait a couple of days. So for uh, people that are closed with uh, staples, as long as that staple line is nice and tight, you know, your epithelium or your top layer of cells grows pretty quickly over top. So showering, you know, a couple of days after surgery is okay. If you're somebody that's left with, you know, that little purse string suture where it's open a wee bit and it's draining, you might want to wait a few more days for that. You can ask your surgeon. In some of, uh, with some of our surgical programs, as long as you live in the city and you have fil filtered water, they say, you know, just go ahead and have your shower, towel dry really well. It's a small dressing that goes over top and it heals pretty quickly. Perfect. And, and one yeah. kind of question on that, I forgot to, to mention that as a caveat to the question. If, if someone sees that their uh, sur surgery site might be still a little bit weepy or weeping, uh, is that yeah. something that they, they should be asking for a little bit more support on or consulting someone for? Yeah, I'd say if you're finding difficulty with that and it's just not closing the way that it should, circle back with your surgeon um, and they should, you know, maybe do a follow-up appointment with you in their clinic just to see if there's anything else that, that's needed for the healing. Perfect. Okay, yeah. well, thank you so much, Deborah. And before I wrap up, just to remind everybody, I know we have some questions here. These slides and the recording, uh, was all. this is all recorded today, including the question and answer portion. So we will make this available on the ostomycanada.ca website. It'll always be up there. You'll always have a chance to access it. So if you want to go review some of the slides uh, or, or listen to the Q&A again, uh, you can definitely go back and check that out. We'll send you an email um, after the webinar with, with where to access that. And uh, we, this is, again, one of our, our quarterly national webinars. So the next time we're going to be having a webinar will be in October. The final topic and date will be coming out very soon. So stay tuned for an email and some social media posts from Ostomy Canada to get a little bit more of that information. But uh, for, for today's webinar, again, I want to thank you, Deborah. I want to thank Hollister again for being able to, uh, to support and put this education in, uh, on today. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, we hope you all had a great time and did learn quite a lot. Um, I don't know if, uh, Dana, you're still on the line here, but if, Dana, if there's any other words you wanted to say before we head out on behalf of Ostomy Canada, I'll, I'll invite you back on. But uh, from at least from me, I'll, I'll thank you, Deborah, and, and hope you have a good rest of the day as well. Yeah, from my perspective, I think um, fan fantastic webinar, so informative. So again, as you said, Troy, thanks so much to Deborah and Hollister for sponsoring this this webinar. And uh, yeah, good to know that it'll be on our website and we'll find a way to be able to answer some of the other questions that were that we ran out of time for. So yeah, a fantastic webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest.